I want to say thank you to Peter for writing this uh, book, which I hope um, a lot of you have read and which is why you're here today. It's um, a really, as described in the title, an intimate portrait of war. It's a very inside of you. It's very um, detailed. It's quite visceral. There's a lot of smell <laughs> and odor and feeling and sensitivity in it. Um, and I wanted to ask you first how what was your kind of intent in writing it? Because it's interesting, you, you shy away from the obvious, the dramatic, the gore, and focus more on these kind of private moments. I, I, um, I, I thought about writing the book for quite a long time, actually. And, uh, and, and one of the problems that I had in actually getting started was that a lot of, every, every time I, I try to approach it and try to sort of think about how I could structure it, it seemed rather, artificial. It seemed like, oh, I've read a book like this that, that lays it out and, and this and this and this way. And um, actually, it, it, it was a, I think the thing that, that actually got me going, actually, and it, 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 it was a strange thing. I came across another book, a, a, a quote from the book of Revelations. And uh, I'm not not one for reading the Bible on the whole, but it, it, it's it, always it, a good place to start. But it's always a good Bible. place to start the Bible, I find. Or finish. But, or finish. Depending. Um, but it actually started with the words "I saw," and I was really, really struck by. And it was a description of sort of a, an apocalyptic battle, I guess. But but it, it, it talked about I saw, and there was something that, that struck me about how direct it was about the business of of witnessing things. The that I found really inspirational. And, and originally, the, the, the working title was actually so that I saw an angel uh, in the sun, which is the quote. And um, I, I realized that actually the structure I really wanted was, 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 was not trying to you know, go from A to Z through something or, or to talk about sort of you know, here is the political history or, or impose a narrative, but actually to let what I'd experienced, try and, and well, tell the own story. Maybe this is the sort of most, um, maybe it's one way to bear witness. When we were talking earlier about um, how do you try and depict reality when you're writing a story for a newspaper, there are certain facts, there are certain quotes, there's a certain form, um, which your book is very different from. You know, um, it's mercifully <laughs> kind of devoid of political backdrop and real politique and the experts quoting or describing and, and without the sort of exposition. Um, but very viscerally, you kind of plunge us into what it's like to drive down a road in Gaza at sunset to meet a kidnapper with kind of gunfire popping off and the kind of churning s anticipation and sickness of that moment and these kind of private moments. Do you feel like that's the... Uh, a more real face of war in a, f in a funny kind of way? Uh, I mean, when, when, when I was going to see publishers for the first few chapters, I mean, uh, one of them actually asked me, he said, well, so what's the big message at the end of the book? And I said, well, the big message at the end of the book is, you know, I've done this for 15 years, and I, I, I can't say what it's like to kill someone. I, I can't say what it's like to be horribly injured. I, I can't say what it's like to have a member of my family killed. But I can actually say, you know, this is what the emotions are like. And, and, and that's what I wanted to do, was to sort of write something that, that said, you, you know, this is what war is like. This is what it smells like. This is what it tastes like. This is what it's like to be someone inside their house and I was observing this, who's, who's so frightened they're about to flee. This is what it's like to be under gunfire and what it feels like. You know, to be so scared you shit yourself. You know, and that's, that's uh, Yeah, I mean, we appreciate that particular revelation. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's in the book, I mean, but it's, it's not a, nice. But, it, but it's a tough thing to, you know, for a journalist, particularly a journalist who's used to working for print of the newspaper and so forth, to know where the balance is of how much you put yourself on the page, how far into your own interior do you go? How much do you explain? Was that tough to find that balance, that voice? Because it's a very different voice from straight journalism. I mean, I didn't want to write a journalism book. I mean, that was that was clear to me from the beginning. And uh, then I had to sort of, I had to think about how much I wanted to be in the book. And I, I, I think, I, I mean, I thought, I obsessed about how do you depict other people's reality? 
how do, how do you sort of get towards the inner life of, of what conflict is? And, and in the end, I mean, a lot of these things you can only understand in what you, you experience. And so I decided that there was, um, I know, I mean, I quite you have to be a prism. I and quite that, that's why I stepped back. I quite often feel like sort of third per the regular third person journalism is, um, you know, that you get in, in the kind of everyday print variety um, is a little bit disingenuous because you're sort of ignoring almost the most important thing for a reader is the, the your observational your observations and, yeah. and how you feel and this guy looks weird or this is scary or this is odd or this yeah. doesn't feel right, this is abnormal or funny or f peculiar. Um, so, yeah, it's a tricky balance, but I think it's sometimes difficult to go from the format that you're used to, to writing in a different voice, to, was it hard for you to put as much, to put yourself on the page, to be honest like that? Oh, well, I think so. I mean, I mean, one of the problems is that you, you, uh, if, you, if, 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 if what you do is straightforward, or well, straightforward print, print journalism, but if you, if you write within a certain convention, then there's a huge amount of discouragement from, from, from writing about, you know, from the heart. And, and actually it was, I, mean, I think one of the reasons I wrote the book was because I felt so dissatisfied with, you know, when I look back at my output, it, it, it seemed... I could see what I was trying to achieve, but there was so much more that I wanted to say about the events that I'd seen, and it was, it was actually liberating to be able to go back and, and look again and, and actually write about some of the events that I'd, I'd seen and, and some of the conflicts I'd been to and write about them in a way that, that I could actually put, put myself into to a degree. I mean, not, not a large amount, but at no, least... You're quite restrained. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely Brit male walker as well. <laughs> I don't know about being Brit male walker as well. I, I, well, maybe because I feel as though it's quite revealing and I open myself quite a lot. But I mean, a lot of people have said that I haven't really opened myself <laughs> at all, um, which is kind of, given how much I fretted about it, kind of slightly tricky, really. It is, it's a tricky thing. You write, um, your opening scene is, is um, you in a uh, uh, Humvee on a, on a patrol in Iraq with an American soldier who's later killed, and he's describing the sort of ghostliness of the other, the adversary, the enemy, and, and how they seem to shape shift and change and then you very nicely segue that into talking about how war and the experience of that is transformative and it changes you and so I wanted to ask a little bit about how you feel that you've changed how you see things differently or it changes um, changes you I don't know I mean I sort of if you'd asked me that question in October I would have said I, it, it, it ch changed me so completely and utterly that uh, that the I, I, you know, I never wanted to change again. I mean, the problem with looking at these things and trying to trying to deal with these issues is that is that what what seems real one day, a transformation that seems real one day, may may not seem so strong sort of six months on. I mean, you must have been through this yourself. But I mean, you know, sometimes it you feel as though what you've seen and what you've lived through just presses down on you in such a such a horrible way and then and then suddenly you, you feel as though you're that person when you started doing this again who suddenly feels sort of light and bold and I mean it's a book very much about trauma too. yeah um, and that's I mean that's a tough thing we had um, a funny conversation on over the weekend when I was reading the book I actually rang Peter in the middle of reading it and said it's a really good book Peter but it's making me have sort of mild panic attacks and I feel quite strange about it I mean I, I it makes me go back to little places and moments and the kind of stuff that you tend to stick in a box in a way that I hadn't expected which is a great testament to your writing but I know you've had those moments too and your, your empathy with the people and societies that have to struggle under struggle with conflict, does that help experiencing it yourself to understand how societies are transformed and suffering from it, under sufferance of it? I, I don't know. I mean, uh, sort of the, the biggest crises I've ever had doing my job are about hating it so much that I never wanted to do it again. So, I mean, I, I, you sometimes feel as though the, the business of listening to other people's story and being empathetic and trying to understand 
because you also Things get, you also really get weary. I mean, it's also repetitive. I mean, there's also that horrible moment, you know, when you're listening to somebody repeat some awful story when you've just, you, it's very familiar and it's I mean, it's one of the reasons. It's, boring. I mean, it's one of the reasons I stopped going to Iraq at the end of 2007. I mean, one of the reasons, not the only reason. And there was another reason, well, two other reasons, and, and that there are was. Many the reasons. <laughs> <laughs> the Just it was very, very. You know, I'd had a lot of bad experiences in a very short period of time, but, 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 but I felt that I, the way I felt that was I was completely jaded. I didn't want to, you know, and maybe it's not a credit to me, but I didn't want to hear the stories again. I felt as though I'd gone through them and I'd listened to them and I'd written them and I just didn't, I mean I think it's one of the things that war does, does is that it, it, it can be such a complete dead end intellectually. It's such a, a heavy lid, it's so killing on, on, on that, that all life becomes compressed to one small series of stories and, and, and that wore me out there because it seemed to be that you know, you would look for, for hopeful things, for, for all ordinary things about life, about the teacher who, who carries on teaching or, or, or the woman who, who's a human rights activist who, who carries on doing it despite being shot. But in the end, it, I mean, I think it's the worst thing about war is that it, 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 it crushes, and that's the way it transforms m most completely in long wars, is that, is that you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel and even for witnesses you can't see the light at the end of the and tunnel. Do you find that alienating and hard to come back to England to, hard to sort of come back and re-enter into a kind of normal life and peaceful dinner party chat and there's a certain alienation that goes Well I'm not a great, a great dinner party person uh, but I mean I, uh, <coughs> I, I mean I do, I do remember very very early on and I just come back from I think it was from covering something in the Balkans, and I'd, I'd been really shocked and was really, really upset about it. And uh, I, I got invited by a neighbour to a dinner party, and uh, it's just one of those things. It, you know, they were talking about this, that, and the other, and I'm not saying it's not important. I can't remember what they were talking about, and all that was in my head, all that was in my head, was wanting to talk about what I'd seen, and they found it really boring. And it was, and they made it quite clear that they found it really boring. That if well, you, I mean, war, if you war correspondents having doing their war stories, I mean, it is. Uh, yeah, I guess it is. But at the same time, it's it's <laughs> can be. It can be, but at the same time, I, I think there's a so sort is, of so is gentrification in Stoke Newington, which is so is yeah, gentrification. So yeah, but there was a self censorship, I think, as well. I mean, people. Well, it's hard to People translate. People don't want to think about it, and that's, it's that's what I It's hard to translate what seems kind of funny or, you know, weird. Or, cause sometimes you start talking about it, and it's just, you listen to yourself sort of describe, oh, it was really funny, there was this severed hand that everyone was trying to take a picture of, and they wouldn't let us, all this peculiar <laughs> moment. And you're like, this is not funny, and this is not appropriate, and this person's <laughs> looking at you like you're completely insane. I mean, there's a dislocation. Yeah, I think there is a dislocation, and I, I think that's the problem with conflict, is that, is that when you... And I, I, you, you know, when the, when, when the prospect of a second war in Iraq uh, was being mooted, and, um, you know, I remember being in a leader conference, and there were people there who were going, you know, it's, um, you know, we've got to get rid of this arsehole, blah, 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 blah. And they thought all the way through to, to the conclusion and the bluebirds flying in the sky, but what they missed out and they'd edited out was all the stuff that's in between, which is war. And, and that was the thing, I, I guess, that I've always been most shocked by, especially with kind of wars of humanitarian intervention, is the way in which people always, in, always edit out the reality, because they don't know what the reality is. They don't know what it smells like. I mean, you know, we come from a generation of politicians, by and large, who, who've never seen conflict. And uh, yeah. I, 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 part of what I wanted to do in The Secret Life of War was to be an antidote to that, to say, look, you know, if you've never seen it, you've never lived through it, as kind of my grandparents did and my great uncles did and my father did, it's like, this is what it's like. I mean, you know, this is how, how destroying it is, this is how jading it is, this is how frightening it is, this is how disconnecting it is. At least to be able to put down on paper, if n even if nobody read it, my sense of what it was like. You say right at the end of your book, almost the sort of epilogue, um, the kind of sum of the 20 years of trauma and experience and thinking about this and being immersed in these awful places and 
and, and conflict and violence, um, maybe it's now it's time to stop. Yeah, I do say that, don't I? I'm going to Gaza next week, probably. So, uh, I mean, so how do you? Are you I, I are kind you of think interested? I've got things in a better balance now. I just like to say I do. I do think I'm working towards it. It's kind of like twelve steps program, really. And I'm not saying I'm a war junkie, but I, it, I think there are. I think it's hard sometimes to get out of it once you've been used to it, because everything else seems tame. Yeah. And maybe not so important. Yeah. Because everything's less important than life or death. Yeah. Um, and it's tough to take a step back sometimes. Also, I think you become slightly typecast. And also, and, and I write about this, I think that it becomes part of your identity. So why do you think you uh, keep doing it? And the people here will know that. I mean, John, you must know this. I mean, it becomes part of your identity, yeah? I mean, it becomes part of what defines who you are. And it's, it's, it's difficult to let go of uh, <coughs> When, when you're in your late 30s or 40s, it becomes very difficult to let go of something that actually gives meaning to your life, especially if, if other things and you s are you still don't interested? seem satisfactory. You're still interested, you're still curious. What balance between kind of curiosity and, fa and, and, and you know, wanting to tell something, wanting to explain something to the jaded? Because it's. I mean, I go through, it's I go, tough I go after a while, it accrues. The it accrues, yeah. It's, I mean, it's incremental, it creeps. A, fr a friend of mine had this. I, th I think the thing is you, you go through these periods of feeling jaded and kind of unable to do it. And, then, and, and I think this is how you work towards the end, is you feel, oh, I never want to go through that again. But then again, there are things that you still want to do. But, but the things that, that you're most interested in become more clearly defined. And, and, and you know, there, there are less of those events that you want to go because there is something that you specifically want to say. And, uh, you know, and I was saying this to you earlier. It's like, I, there, there is a truth in the end of the book, an absolute truth. And that's when the war in Gaza happened earlier this year. For the first time ever, I was happy to be the guy who got sent to do the afterward stuff. And I wasn't sort of screaming out to go and you know, trample over the twitching bodies of my journalist colleagues to be out there first, because I wasn't. I was happy about the way that things worked out. Yeah, I could have taken it or, or left it. I was still wanted to go. I was still curious, because I know and like Gaza. And I think that will probably, as I get older, be more of the way I go. And maybe that's a very belated so tell me Growing about up. the bright spots. Tell me about the things or the mm. moments that give you hope instead of just provide extra weight to the crush of spirit. And tell me um, how you notice that societies heal or there are periods of relief or people getting over these things. Um, <coughs> what helps? I mean, the bright spots are always uh, the people. I mean, they're always the people. It's always the school teacher in Iraq who after everyone else has given up, or the, the woman university professor down in Basra who's still going to teach art despite the fact she's getting threatened. Or, um, it is extraordinary the way you come across these people who are yeah. retain a sense of humor or optimism yeah. or still manage to get up in the morning. And Yeah, the guy who runs the youth group who I met in Kandahar. And it's just, just a kind of, just, I don't know, I mean, if I believed in religion or anything, it just fills your spirit with hope, just because it seems so positive. There's a, there's a, one, a young woman I met in Kabul who was a basketball player, and uh, I, I made a, a short film about her with Antonio Olmos, and she was involved in, in she was on the, the, the women's national basketball team, and she ran this women's political group to get schoolgirls involved in, in politics and to become activists. and. <coughs> She's the coolest person I've met in years. She was just so amazing. And I think, you know, that's what keeps you going. As, as far as what heals, I mean, it's what, what we forget about is, is kind of reconciliation, legitimacy, justice, all the things, that are the classic <laughs> things about reconciliation dialogue. But most of all, the kind of sharing of stories. Because if the stories, stories, if the stories don't get shared, then the barriers don't break down. And I, I mean, I was in Sarajevo a couple of weeks ago in Bosnia, and was, uh, it, it just it amazed me how little progress had been made on intercommunity reconciliation there, and that that 
you, you know, but that kind of underlined it for me. I mean, from time to time, there is reconciliation and, and that process of talk and heal or whatever. They've done it in Rwanda to some extent. Yeah. They did it in South Africa and there are other places to a greater or lesser extent. But it seems actually that the collective experiences, when a society experiences something um, traumatic, it doesn't really heal and that those wounds get I think it suppressed. does over Sometimes time. time manages to do it, but, but I mean, I always thought, I mean, I read about this a lot, about partly why Iraq was so screwed up uh, post-American invasion was partly because of the breakdown of society that was a consequence yeah. of the trauma of Iran-Iraq <coughs> war and Saddam yeah. and repression and poverty and all the rest of it. It was just a society in, in psychological crisis. Yeah. Um, and, and the longevity of that makes it, you know, you're, it's what you talk about when you write about, you know, the kids in, gro in Gaza growing up in this, you know, us and them and, and violence and hatred or whatever, um, it's really difficult to break the cycle the longer it goes on. But I mean, I, it, for me, and this is, you know... It gets inculcated. It's but, I mean, it, but, but for me, I mean, it's like one of the sort of abiding lessons of, of, of most of the conflicts that I've ever covered is that, you know, we sort of, m many of them have involved sort of interventions from outside and we charge in there and we say, well, democracy is what happens when everyone gets to vote and gets their thumb colored purple and, and then you have these institutions and that's a democracy and, and you don't have a free press and you don't have grassroots societies and you don't have people who are trying to cross the different you yeah, know, it to community it divides. It, it has to, to come, come that absolutely, way, not that, yeah. Absolutely, and, and it, it, it's, 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 it's a long-term business and it's, it's a hard effort. And uh, I mean, I was talking to, I, I actually saw Paddy Ashton at House of Lords a couple of weeks ago who actually said, you know, what he thought was the problem was exactly that. And he'd been involved in one of these great top-down organizations that said, well, we just haven't given it enough time for, for people to solve the problems from the bottom up. And uh, it's, you, you know, it seems a lot of what we've done in the last 15 bottom years up seems to and be also, wrong. And also, I think, locally mm -hmm. grown. And locally grown, yeah, absolutely. I think it's important too. Should we throw it open yes, to the floor? Yeah. Um, I don't know whether this has provoked any questions about nature of war corresponding or the authenticity of bearing witness and ways in which you do that. <laughs> Mr. Andrew Hogg. <laughs> Peter, I've not yet read your book. I do apologise. I've no doubt by the end of the week I will have done. Um, you, you've been quite disparaging um, on, on several occasions during your talk about the whole question of intervention. And yet there, the, the reality is that uh, sort of a generation of British journalists who cover Bosnia during the actual fighting were basically praying for intervention on a daily basis because of what they saw. I, I felt exactly the same during Kosovo. I mean, you well, know, I kind of thought it was a solution, but I mean, may, <coughs> maybe you don't get what you ask for. I mean, maybe what gets delivered well, is hang not. Well, in Pristina today, there is, you know, a Bill Clinton Boulevard. Yeah, um, and it's, people of Kosovo were pretty happy about intervention. What I'm curious about. Well, is if you're an Albanian, yeah, a Kosovo Albanian, yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of talking on their behalf. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm curious about is uh, at that, w where the whole kind of the balance tipped effectively was after the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq. Were you at any stage tempted to support either of those two interventions? at the outset because of the human rights abuses that have been perpetrated by the states that uh, were in control in, at that particular time? Uh, no, I, f I kind of felt myself in a very, very difficult position. I mean, um, a guy I used to share a desk with was executed by Saddam. Um, so, I mean, not, not only did I know what went on in Saddam's Iraq, but I also had a personal experience of having a colleague murdered. and. Uh, and yet, at the same time, I got to the stage where I thought, you know, if war is the answer, then what's the question? Um, and despite the fact that I, I did support intervention in Kosovo, I, I'm, I, but, I, but when I see the, the results in Kosovo and Bosnia, which I, I thought were just wars, you know, just interventions, I'm not quite sure anymore if, if, if the ends justified the means. I, d I don't feel that comfortable with what's come out of it. And, th and that's my problem. I don't feel that comfortable. But the reality is you do have a, uh, a Kosovo Albanian population who's still in their homes. You have got a, 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 uh, 
a Bosnian society which is incredibly split down the middle, but at least people are still in their homes. Well, people Kosovo, still Kosovo is split. Done. I mean, Kosovo did have a Serbian population as well, and now most of them are sort of a diminished. A I mean, wh whatever happened from the Serbian population, the fact that you know Serbian life in Kosovo has been diminished to an absolute rump and a, a kind of slightly poisonous rump in, in, in you know in Mitrovica North doesn't seem to me to be like a good result and uh, it, it doesn't and it, it, it you know it is it is a it is a society that seems to me ever ever more to pushing towards you know a single ethnic expression of political identity and I don't feel comfortable about that and and but essentially know, that's what the Serbs are doing themselves I know that's what the Serbs are doing themselves but 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 you know you have the crisis, and then you have the solution that's not a solution at all. Um, well, it's partition. Partition. I don't feel comfortable with it. I mean, I don't feel comfortable with it. We have a yeah, hello. Um, <coughs> Richard Pendry, um, for University of Kent and uh, ex-Frontline News. I, I read a tiny bit of your book, and I will read the rest of it very soon. Um, and you wrote, I thought, quite interestingly about meeting people with guns as a journalist who, who doesn't have a gun um, and what that feels like. And I just wondered whether you had a view about, about reporters carrying guns, given, given the nature of the threat to journalists these days. Well, I had a conversation once with my fixer and translator in Iraq where they were desperate to buy a, a handgun to have in the car when we were traveling on our own, and they thought it would be a good idea. And I, I always said no. Um, for a long time, I said no. I thought it was a bad idea to have a gun. And, um, and then um, Jill Carroll uh, got kidnapped. And uh, I got some armed guards. And, um, and yeah, th th there was a moment, I mean, I, and I describe it in the book, where my guards used to leave their guns in my room every night. And, uh, and I sort of, uh, they used to prey on my mind that I had these two loaded AK-47s in my room. And one night, I woke up about 3 o'clock in the morning. These bloody things were still there. And, and it had all been quite scary. We'd been doing some quite scary stuff. And everyone had been scaring each other with talk about what, what would happen if this happened and that happened. And how would we get out if we got attacked? And, and, um, and I, I always thought, I always thought that, that there would never be a moment of temptation. And it wasn't a long moment of temptation. I mean, it lasted kind of about three or four minutes until I could go back to sleep again. But there was a moment in which I clearly, you know, I looked at this weapon and I thought, well, what happened if tonight someone came through this door? Would I, would I ever use a weapon? And, and I realized that maybe I would. And that, that was a bad thing for me is the realization that you could actually pick up a weapon and use it. Because I'd always thought that you could survive in these environments was by, that, by being it, a writer. Was that a line that you felt It was off? a really big line, because I'd always loved that whole I know, that, neutral big, that sticker on the side yeah. with a line through it that says, you know, no weapons in this vehicle. And then, you know, and then suddenly you find that not only have you got a guy sitting behind you, who's got an AK-47 and a pistol tucked in his waist, but there's a guy in a car behind him who's armed. And, you know, sometimes there'd be a car in front where there's a guy with weapons. And actually, the whole idea that, that you're not armed in any way becomes a complete, a complete lie, because actually, you're traveling with a whole bunch of guys who are heavily armed. And, but that's exactly the way that the New York Times, the Washington Post, I mean, I mean know, that people, was, that was the reality of it. Yeah, Iraq, that was the reality there of wasn't, it. I mean, that was what it was you couldn't yeah and I, d I didn't like it I didn't like it at all and uh, I don't think journalists should carry weapons and actually I don't think journalists should have guns in their bedrooms because <laughs> you can't sleep very well <laughs> gonna, um, but that took a lot of learning a, a, fr a friend of mine in, in Iraq was describing how he, he was really embarrassed and I won't, I won't, I won't tell, explain any details at all apart from the fact he, he did take a gun to an interview and then he, he put it in his waistband of his of his trousers, and then it and it sort of dropped, fell down into his. <laughs> and he was doing the interview with this gun, sort of in his trousers, and he and he just felt this was farce, actually, it was silly because he wasn't trained, he didn't know what he was doing. 
it is, it is, it's a very odd situation for a journalist. It, ca it kind of asks a really, really big question about what, what we're doing when we travel tooled up, I think. And it's, uh, well, even you're, you're suddenly potentially part of the story. You're I mean, potentially you part gonna, of yeah, the story, You're actually yeah. going to fire back. Yeah. I mean, that's, or, that, that's what you're saying. Or, or are you going to leave that nice guy, Eamon and Tahir, who are in the, the following car behind, to, 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 to fight while... You know, they take you away. I mean, it, it just it, the, the dilemmas that it causes are are almost more 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 unpleasant than. Uh, and it's I don't don't look back on that period of 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 having armed guards, and it was for about six or seven months. I don't don't look back on that at all with any pride at all. I mean, it, it, I, f I I feel ashamed of that. I think it's. Uh, but, but, you know, that's just how I feel. I feel slightly ashamed about it. Hi, John. Hey, I uh, also haven't read the book yet, but uh, I will by the end of the week. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, you said earlier about um, not, uh, about a lot of politicians now have not any experience of war, um, but our job is to explain to the world, or as many people as we can, what war is really like, what it smells like, you know, what how scared you can be, how scared people in that situation can be who can't go home. I've noticed over the last couple of years, a lot of the I get a lot of emails from people from the work I've done, but most most often it's families or friends of soldiers that I've been with, or you know, worse, wives of of guys that have been killed, and they're people who already have a vested interest in learning about the war. And I wonder how many people are we reaching who, who aren't already searching for the information we're providing? How much information are we giving to, to the politicians who've never been there? I don't know. That, that, that worries me to a degree because uh, we've been through such a long period of war and uh, so much of it seems the same. I mean, same background, political narratives, same, same ideas same descriptions, same experiences. So the, the, one of the things that worries me, and it, it worries me a lot, is that the, the people have compartmentalized their own lives from the lives of those people who are going to war, whether they're you know, British or American soldiers whose stories are incredibly interesting because they feel as though they're separate from mainstream society, much as the way that the people who went and fought in Vietnam felt uh, compartmentalized and separate from mainstream society, which, which was very, very damaging. And uh, I, I, I think, you, you know, when, I mean, you just look at the, the relative lack of success of most of the Iraq war films, and that gives you a pretty strong indicator of, of, of how people would rather be looking at something else and uh, and then quite how you dramatize these events when people aren't interested in looking and when they're slightly embarrassed well more than slightly embarrassed when it, 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 it's something they don't really want to engage with it, it, I think is the one of the big challenges for, for, for people in our profession I don't know I still believe that you know a lot of those Iraq films of which I wrote one I have to admit um, did badly because they weren't very good films. You know, they were earnest and lecturing and hectoring and and not. I just I, I just thought they were kind of dull and tendentious a bit. Um, and to a certain extent, you know, it's how you tell the story, it's how you communicate something, how you find a character that people can identify with or follow or care about, how you communicate the other or or the interior life of war or a moment or a emotion that you just we just have to try harder and do better but, I mean, trying to do that to a certain extent that there's always going to be the kind of um, the repetition of the day-to-day -day bomb blast or whatever that doesn't break through everybody's day-to-day -day life particularly if they don't have somebody serving there or somebody um, or uh, don't have a direct involvement or a direct vested interest and you have to find a story that somehow breaks through something into a universal it's hard um, but there have been great ones, like often. in the Valley of Eli, is a, is a wonderful film, I think, and yeah, it, it opened yeah. in a handful of cinemas. I know it's a good film, though. It's a good film. I was going to ask, have you seen Generation Kill yet? 
I've just finished the wire. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I haven't quite got there yet. Which one is Generation, Generation Kill? Generation Kill is the book, um, the embedded American journalist. It's, da it's David Simon, yeah? Yes. Yeah, I, I haven't quite got to it yet. No, no, I mean... Because I was the, I, assistant, I'm looking forward to the it. assistant director on when it started and worked on it for nine months, uh, about three months, sorry, three months. And that was every single word that was in it was what the guy said. So the risk was that it would be really boring because you just don't want to hear everything they said. But he insisted that all the characters were the real characters and everything they said was in the film. And then when they came to it, they were all in Humvees. So the first five were in there and then the next, and so you hardly saw the ones at the back. But they had to be in it and he wouldn't cut them out and they had their one line. And it took nine months to film and you know, by the sort of second month, everyone's really bored because they're stuck in the back Humvee. But what was incredible about it is that they got permission to do it and they put a lot of money into it, knowing that probably by the time they finished it, the war would be finished and Bush would be out and all the things that it raises would be over. But I think, looking at the audience figures in America, that it's actually going to have a sort of long life because basically all of them are saying, well, why are we here? Uh, and these are the Marines who are trained to go in. And it's a very honest well, it's thing. It's, 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 sort of it, it's sort of the classic case. It's the first rule of storytelling, too. Sometimes just go way to the ground, go as close to the source, get as real as you, as you possibly can and as honest as you can. And sometimes that stuff transcends that week or that news cycle or that debate cycle. Um, because it's more real, more honest, and source work is always the most compelling because... It would be interesting to see. Mm. I completely agree. I mean, think, A Bright and Shining Lie, which is one of the great, great books of Vietnam, came out how many years after? Seven, eight years? I mean, y y you know, thing, things don't have to, to appear in, in the week or the year the events take place and to be timely. I mean, you know, or, I to be, or to be good. I always thought that MASH, that great you know, Alan Alda thing that was set in Korea, but ostensibly about Vietnam, yeah. but, but played in the 80s, yeah. do you know what I mean, was one of those sort of classic things that was sort of after the fact and yet addressed a whole sort of generation of issues that hadn't been, and with humor and with, you know, it's just sometimes finding the media, the medium or the way that something connects and it's not. Well, look at Apocalypse Now. I mean, yeah. when was that? That came out in 79, 80. And, you, you know, was talking about a war, you know, that ended nearly a decade before. And yet, and yet there hadn't been a film as good about Vietnam, uh, I would argue, and, until that film came out. And it's but formed a whole series of great, great based films. On, based on a story that's about the rape yeah. of Congo. So, yeah. you know, I mean, these things... I mean, these things have their life. And I, but so what are you actually talking about in the end? I mean, what's Apocalypse Now talking about? What was the Heart of Darkness talking about? It was talking about sort of the nature of... Uh, nature of violence, and and so, you know, one one hopes the 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 good stuff is timeless because actually, even some of my favourite reporters, when you look back and you read what they've written, seem terribly fixed in the here and now, and it's actually the the longer stuff that actually seems to have a a real genuine resonance that well, we were talking earlier about Vasily Grossman yeah. you know who actually fictionalized his account yeah. of the second of the you know um, yeah. eastern front in the second war and god knows what bits of that are true or not but he's superseded i mean he's outlasted yeah. it might as well be the truth yeah oh, but it has an internal point. truth it has, it, you know, it has a, it has a greater has a honesty great, yeah, than a greater a fact, honesty yeah which you know which sometimes and the reason he ended up going to the front in the very first place is because th th his editor, uh, you know, said, you know, well, he may not be fit to be a soldier, but he's got a novelist's heart, and that's why they sent him. And, you know, that's why he was such a great war correspondent, I think, is because he had this kind of ability to kind of strip, strip things back. Hi. I wonder if you could give me an example of a time when you felt yourself to be instrumentalized by one side or the other in a conflict, when you felt yourself to be used by one side or the other, and you're, you, sort of, you, f you feel that maybe your, your objectivity has been perhaps betrayed. Oh, that's, that's easy, actually, and it goes back to Kosovo, I'm afraid. I, um, I, I was driving up to the mountains one day with uh, an American colleague, and there was this kind, of, this kind of little war memorial that had been set up, and... So I stopped, and it was a KLA war memorial, and it was by this little farm. And this, this guy had obviously been killed. I mean, he died. That was real. And so uh, we went to interview the family, and uh, 
and um, and we got this whole story about you know he he how he he you know lived in Europe. He'd, you know, and there was all these details, and I, I wrote up all these details about the guy who came back from Europe to Kosovo and, and, and wrote about it. This kind of very sweet little memorial that had been set up by his family, even as the war was going on. Then by chance, two days later, I was with a German friend, and we were driving up, and there's the same memorial. He hadn't seen it, and he goes, oh, come on, come on, can we stop? And I said, well, I've already done this, but yeah. So we stopped, and I sat down there, and. I listened to the translation, and, and uh, it was the same name, but the guy lives somewhere else now. He was a gastarbeiter from Germany, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and there was more and more people turned up to write all this stuff down, and, and, and the story had been changed, and it was a piece of classic propaganda, and uh, I, I've no idea who was behind it, whether the family who seemed to be fairly simple farmers or whether someone was a bit smarter behind it, but, but it was just kind of like, this is the road the journalists drive up, up to go to war every day, and, and kind of you get there and there's, there's the brother who speaks German and the brother who speaks English, and you, I, I felt like such an utter pillock because, you know, I, I just felt cheated by it. I mean, I really did. And, and, and I mean, I've, 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 I, whenever I think about the stories that people tell you, I always have that in the back of my mind about just how vulnerable we are. I mean, I'm sure the central truth of it, you know, exists as a central truth. He died fighting. But, but the way in which it had been repackaged quite so easily for every audience that drove up in their crappy old golf. Um, and I, I'll never forget that. And I still feel. You sometimes feel like it's a sort of natural thing to ham yeah. up. Yeah. It, it does, I mean, not that, you know, stories in Iraq ever need to be hammed up no. very much, but, but it, it's hard sometimes. You know, you know you're providing an audience and you know there's. The, stops, the sob story, the need, the tragedy, the thing that needs to. It's hard sometimes to check or know exactly where, how honest that account is. Well, I mean, I think for me, the, the, the worst thing was that people used to tell you things in Iraq and, uh, you know, to, to dramatize the story. And I, I remember going to this hotel that had got blown up and it had been blown up by a car bomb. And I knew this because there's a huge hole in the ground and there was a car inside it, <laughs> and it looked like a car bomb. And there, but it was an American helicopter missile. It was an American helicopter no, every missile. Every car bomb that in every Baghdad for a year was an American helicopter missile. I, eyewitness a, accounts, 10 minutes eyewitness after accounts, the fact. Eyewitness accounts, 10 minutes Absolutely. after the fact. And I'd literally been like two or 300 meters away when this thing exploded. And you know, I didn't see a helicopter. And there was bits of the engine all over the place. And, uh, and, uh, but the problem with that, and because and, and I'd had so many of these kind of slightly, slightly overblown stories about events where you could see other things going on, was that, was that when people started talking about what was going on in, in Abu Ghraib, uh, it seemed like crap to me, and it seemed like crap to a lot of people, because, because the because the, the quality of the stories had been so degraded by all these kind of really weird stories you'd hear, like the Americans can see through women's clothes with, with eyeglasses. And I got used Truth. to... Really? Yeah, they've got those I tried to, it never worked for me. <laughs> but no, they're, they're, got they're, they're not. They've machines that you walk past. It was sort of based on this. But the, 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 the point is, no, no, there were lots the of those is, things. And then suddenly there was this huge story and, and uh, yeah, my fixer came to me and said, look, there's this going on, and blah, blah, blah. And I, I, had, uh, I had been a period, I'd been there for, for about two or three months, and I heard so many mad stories that I'd actually stopped believing the stories that were real, like a lot of people had stopped believing the stories that were real. And then, of course, there's this huge real story, and it gets picked up in America by journalists reporting from there, rather than the reporters on the ground, because because we've heard so many extraordinary stories. And that, for me, would be the other, the other way in which you, 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 I, I felt I missed I miss the story because people had tried to use me for so much to try and tell one version of the story that I missed the real story. And I think that was true of, that was true of quite a few people. Now, I remember listening to those Abu Ghraib, Abu Ghraib stories, too. And it was really hard. It wasn't that you didn't necessarily 
disbelieve them, but there was no way to check and there was no way to augment this or verify, you know what I mean? There was no, it yeah. was just I mean, one person well. telling you something. And that was actually true of almost all the reporting in Iraq. And every time, every time, you know, you'd suddenly get into the hinterland of a kid being kidnapped or whatever, and you suddenly realize it wasn't just kidnapped off the crime. street, it was yeah. some uncle, and yeah. it was some weird clan thing that the father owed money. And, you know, it was always, it was very difficult to get any clear handle on that stuff that made you suspicious of people. It's very hard to report, a, um, you know, just a direct, this happened to me. But I think in the end that was, you, you know, that's part of the problem is that we still ended up seeing sort of very clear cut stories week after week after week and yet every story that one used to encounter was fantastically murky. And, uh, I, you know, I'm always suspicious of stories that seem too joined up. I mean, you know, the best stories are ones that are kind of messy because they, I mean, for me they always have an intrinsic truth because if, if someone can you know, fill in all the gaps, and I always wonder why they can fill in the gaps. And that, that's kind of increasingly, and the older I've got, it's always become a rule. If, if it makes too much sense, I'm suspicious. Uh, you know, it should have loose ends and, and some, some, some smoke around it, really. Um. Do you think the reporting helps to end conflict? I mean, do you think do you, do you still have confidence that reporting actually has any? No, impact? I don't have confidence that reporting helps to end conflict anymore. No, I don't have confidence. <laughs> I, re I just don't. I used to think that you know part of the calling of going and covering conflicts was that in the end that that you were contributing towards some some sort of just and equitable solution, but uh, I, I d I'm not sure I believe that anymore. And have you ever wanted to act, for example, as an advisor to the Foreign Office or to the State Department? And if no. you did do that, then what would you say to when they get calls from DOD or from MOD saying, we need to do something here? I mean, would your line always be that we should never intervene, we should never do, we should never well, act? Uh, uh, thankfully, the question's never come up. <laughs> no one in their right mind would ask me. <laughs> They'd get the wrong answer. I, I think these organizations tend to ask people to get the right, the right answer to the question they're asking. Peter, I'd just like to say that you know anybody worried about where the truth comes from or what's happening with the news should read Nick Davis's book, Flat Earth News, which is a good starting point of what's happening now in all media. But to change tact, um, you're a family man, I was a family man. When I was offered a job in covering the Arab-Israeli war 67, my wife said, hmm, do it, but make sure you're covered by insurance. <laughs> now, since then, my students, I now teach at university, find out when they go, and they're very, very good people, they're very dedicated, they want to cover the stories, there's no insurance at all available to them. So if they get shot, injured, or wounded, there's nothing. I mean, what the hell is going on with the news now? Oh, I don't know about it just being the news. I mean, I can't get life insurance. Uh, so, and I, you know, I'm employed by an organization. I mean, you know, I, I would get a lump sum payment from my organization uh, if, if, if I was uh, hurt or, or something worse. But, I mean, you know, I can't cover my mortgage because uh, I can't find anyone to cover me. So I, I don't know that just about just that being a consequence of, uh, of the newspapers. I mean, I, I would quite like to be insured a little more fully myself, and I can't do it. Uh, my name's Gareth Bentley. I'm doing some research on the use of emotion by foreign correspondents reporting conflict. I've interviewed quite a lot of your colleagues uh, in broadcast and print journalism. Um, I just wonder, is there something unique about your recent experience of reporting in Iraq that's to do with um, the amount of time that you spent there? Or is it to do with some um, characteristic of post-Cold War conflict that, as you've already alluded to, links up with, say, Second World War experiences of, of the brutality of societal violence. Is there something 
in your 15 years of experience that's happened recently that you haven't experienced before that's not just related to um, guns particularly, which, which obviously is an important aspect for you? Um, I've got many more questions, but I'll stick with that one. I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question, I'm afraid. Maybe I'm being a little dense. I mean, I are you asking me whether I've noticed that something is... Well, I mean, I, s I suppose the thing I have noticed um, in some conflicts is the way in which there's the privatization and fragmentation of war. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I suspect, to a degree, it was always such. I mean, I think that's what happened, you know, with the the Maquis in France and in, in Yugoslavia. But I, I, I think sort of the, the privatization by ideology, criminal organisations. Um, I, I think we operate in uh, on, on much more fragmented battlefields run by much more self-interested groups, uh, often kind of coming together in ad hoc alliances. I, I think that's what I've noticed. So just to kind of reiterate then, do, what what is it exactly do you think that is there something wrong with mainstream use of emotion in reporting conflict that you are trying to get through in your book as well, that, that really you think there is something missing? You've talked a lot about how uh, you don't think, think that reporting war has leads to less war. Is there, is there something that you think that, that you're trying to do in your book that can't be done in mainstream journalism? Well, I mean, I don't think... I <laughs> Well, I, one of the reasons I don't, don't think it can be done in mainstream journalism because because I think it's the difference between writing an 80,000-word book and writing a 1,200-word news lead. I mean, I don't think there's the space to talk about some of the issues. I mean, I, I, I mean, I wish there was the space in in, in in newspapers to talk about some of the issues, but. But I think it's I think it's the difference between long form and short form journalism, and uh, I think they they're different styles of writing, and I think they have different demands. So I'm not sure it's necessarily a failure of uh, I'm not sure it's necessarily a failure of the of, of mainstream journalism, which is guilty of many failures, um, and I've been responsible for some of them. But I I I, th I, I think it's simply a difference between between what, what's possible in, uh, in writing a different lens, and I think you'd agree with that. I mean, even if you write a sort of huge long piece in the New Yorker, it's not the same as writing a book. I mean, you have so much room for texture and nuance. Yeah, it's, 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 different. it's a different format. You know, there's an everyday shtick um, for print journalism, and there's a sort of slightly longer shtick for the observer at the end of the week. Um, and then there's the feature piece, and then, it, you know, it's it's third person, not first person. You know, there's a certain gradation of how much the journalist is putting into the story, and there's a convention, particularly in the states, but here too, that you don't put yourself yeah. in the in the piece, and you don't have an emotional reaction to what you're seeing, and that those emotional reactions and those personal connections to a story come in the in the in the in the journalist book that arrives two or three years later when they sit down and think through what really had an effect and what they mo remember in those sort of moments. Um, and maybe there's a place for a bit more of it. I mean, occasionally you do notice something first person when the journalist has been absolutely under fire or arrested or something's happened specifically to them that makes them kind of the main character in the story. And actually, they, sometimes you get a front page splash and it seems unusual and a bit odd and out of place to have a first person thing. But it breaks through the kind of quotidian, everyday, thing that you're used to seeing in a newspaper and actually I think sometimes yeah. you know, by providing a contrast gives you I think it just just different you know different um, different forums different spaces I mean I do think you know bo both approaches have have risks I mean the emotional response you know can be incredibly effective but at the same time it because because to have such an emotional response generally you have to Ha believe that you understand what's taken place and to be angry about it or sad about it or sympathetic about it and I think the real challenge is is, is not for sympathetic angry journalism but but in contrast to simply for 
empathetic journalism mm. where there's been, uh, you know, and I, they're often confused, but I think there's a, the thing about empathy is there's a huge amount of effort required to, to, to be truly empathetic because it requires you to study more, to ask more, to be more imaginative, you know, to think more about about wh you know why a human being who you're, who's sitting in front of you may have done something that may seem despicable to you, but to understand the circumstances of it, and I think that's the challenge: is 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 is, is, is not necessary to write sympathetically, but to write empathetically, and I think because because it can be so hard to. I mean, it's very. It's, I mean, it's very easy to write sort of bleeding heart stuff about you know women with kids. It's harder to give weight and context to a fighter who seems to be on the other side, to make them into a human being, to communicate their reality in their context without being angry or judgmental in a kind of obvious way. That's and I think you've, you've hit, hit the nail on the head, is, but, but, but by failing to represent that other person as being actually human, that you're failing to do any kind of... I think angry journalism, journalism is just another word for propaganda yeah you know frankly it, it, there's no place for that really ever then you're an activist then you've picked a side then that's a that's a different kind of profession it may something that you've seen or witnessed may make you angry and then you cross that side and get a different job put a different hat on but I don't think or write in a different way in a different but I place. don't think that there's a place for that in what you're journalism you're trying to bring as much truth as you can to tell a story and anger is not helpful no no, I, I agree with that. Um, uh, le leaving, I, mean, I completely understand what you're saying about anger and empathy and all the rest of it, but just in terms of the, of the technology, I mean, isn't that what the, what the internet's for? Isn't that what blogs are for? And you've got the opportunity these days, pretty much wherever you are, unless you're somewhere really odd in Africa, where you can blog every day, several times a day if you want, and you can write whatever you want, you can write reams. You can write a whole novel in a couple of weeks. But it's got to be good time. if you want anyone to yeah, read it. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> it. It's got to be good. I it's mean, quality control. Yes. That, I mean, that's the only thing. I mean, I mean it all writing is writing. I mean, I think there's the, you know, there's an artificial distinction between it's blogging and, it's all and print it's journalism just, it's or just making just films. You what know, do you want to read? it's actually got to you, you know, it, it's got to stand the test of time. And you know, I could sit down and witter on endlessly or Twitter on endlessly, whatever it's called now. You know, uh, you know. After soon, after yeah, sit. I'm, I'm not sure whether Twitter is really the answer. No, but but you, you could do that, and I, you know, I could immediately go back to my room after having seen something and just kind of, you know, slap my hands down like a seal on the keyboard about you know what I feel and all this kind of stuff. But it, you know, but and I, I do think there's a virtue to blogging, but I don't see why blogging should be different to any other kind of writing. It should be considered. Yeah, you yeah, know, you should I'm think not about it. Boring blogging about nothing in particular about what you, what, you know, there's an awful lot of blogging which is like that, and it's not, it's not very interesting. L lots of interesting writers do quite boring blogs. Yeah, I think possible to do very interesting. I mean, I, th I think the quality thing, I mean, you were talking about Neil Sheen and Bright Shining Lion, that it came out, you know, Apocalypse and all these things that came out much later, that sometimes it's way after the fact that you actually have the gestation and the consideration to sit down and write a story that isn't tied to the political narrative or debate of that time that stands the test of time that you know it's just a sort of gestation and time sometimes that that's more important than uh, that that lasts longer than an immediate reaction not to negate the in, the importance of an immediate reaction which is the everyday news or a blog or whatever but they're two different, well, two different let things. me give you my favorite example yeah, 12 years. Mm. Or, or the disasters mm. of war by Goya. Yeah. I mean, what was that? Nearly 30 years after he, he, yeah. he drew those sketches? And they, they have no less truth by being published so long after he witnessed those events than being published at the time. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't think there's an absolute necessity for things to be absolutely up to date if, if they can have but it's you know, not more news, meaning it's later. something else. Yeah. No, that, that, that would be the, the, the epistolary or the, the diary, you know, version of it. Well, that's what I'm saying is it's not news and it's not a feature of the New Yorker, but it could be whatever you want because that's what the internet's for. 
Well, I, I don't know if it's what the internet is for. I mean, it's what writing is for. I mean, that, that's where I disagree with you. Yeah, it's what yeah. writing is for. I mean, it doesn't have to be on the internet. It could be anywhere. I mean, or it would, could take any form. It could take, that's the point. Yeah, I, I don't think we're arguing. It's just that you know, when, when, you, when, I, when I was in front of my I, 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 but again, I still feel sometimes just the feeling of some, the, the ability to, to write as much as you want is a curse. I mean, because, yeah, I mean, that's not... Uh, well, are we kind of I missing mean, a certain element here, which is the fact that blogging is independent by its very nature, um, whereas whatever organ you're particularly working for is in itself imposing a degree of quality control for better or for worse. You know what you are getting if you are subscribing to The New Yorker or if you are buying The Observer newspaper. Well, I mean... And, and, you know, by, by, by su suggesting that we're, we're all kind of... You know, every journalist is free to... You know, everybody is free to write what they want to write. Yeah, nobody's trying to stop that. But by the same token, I wouldn't really compare blogging to the work of you know, a reporter who is having his work put through a series of tests, whether for good or for bad, by the organ for which he's working or she's uh, working. I think, uh, I think some blogs, you know, are better than others, and absolutely. some journalists and some papers are better than others. I mean, you know, the Americans fact-check everything, yeah. and the Brits never fact-check anything. There's no <laughs> tradition of fact-checking, you know, in English journalism at all. So, you know, whether you trust one story or another comes with your experience of reading that person and it ringing true over time. I think it's the same with a newspaper or a journalist or a blogger. I mean, call me old-fashioned, but I think all writing should be stress-tested up to a point, whether by, the, right. whether by readers or otherwise. I mean, you know, you know look at T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. I mean, you know, if that hadn't been stress-tested... Not by Ezra Pound. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it would not be, not be what it is. I mean, you know, that, that's why we employ editors. I mean, I've been an editor, and it's, it's part of the process. Just very briefly, I, I wrote a piece for um, a Canadian magazine and I got a call from their fact checker today and the, uh, the, the main protagonist in the piece I was writing, his name was Constance, uh, sorry, his name was Constantine, um, but somehow I'd put the name Constance into the copy I'd sent them. They'd been on the point of just changing that to Connie all the way through. <laughs> and the fact checker <laughs> called me and said, we're about to change it to Connie, are you sure that you've got it... Uh, are you sure Constance is the right name? I digress. What I just wanted to quickly ask you, just one quick question, was this. What fault lines out there that you have not reported on would you like to report on? Uh, oh, the, the one I've always wanted to do was Somalia, but it just seems too impossible. I mean, I know people who do it. Huh? Buy a boat. Yeah, I could buy a tanker. I, I just kind of think there's a fascinating story there if you could actually somehow really, really get into it and report it. But um, yeah, I think it speaks for itself. <laughs> what does the future hold for war reporting? Is it now too dangerous for journalists? Uh, no. No, I mean, there's plenty of people out there still reporting. I think it. it, it, it it's as dangerous as, as people are prepared to accept. And there are people who are prepared to work in very, very dangerous places. There's a photographer I know who, who, who worked in Somalia when pretty much no one else is working there. And she did some amazing stuff. And uh, it's, 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 um, it's, it's what you're prepared to accept, I think. I think it's, uh, you know, it's never too dangerous. Because there will always be someone who's prepared to do it. Um, for whatever reason, and often very well, I hope. Uh, uh, Peter, at the end of your initial introduction talk, um, you expressed your frustration with politicians for not paying attention to wars after the ink had dried on their voters' fingers and um, they'd established democracy. Um, what kind of responsibility do you think you have as a war journalist to report on the aftermath of wars, um, keep going back to places afterwards on, on the reality after the uh, peace processes are officially I, uh, over? 
I, I have to say that I, I, I actually often find going back as, as interesting as covering places during conflict periods. Like I said, I just, just come back from, from Bosnia and I go back there every, not as often as I'd like, because I think it's a fascinating place. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think there's a huge responsibility to keep going back and writing about places. Because um, we sometimes, you, you know, the fighting might end, but the, but, but the things that cause the conflict uh, still exist for a long time. And uh, I, 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 I don't think journalists should be infected by the kind of uh, the, the job done banner mentality, because all oh, what mission accomplished. Uh, because I think. Well, it's always interesting, too, how many conflicts. You know, the, the fighting stops, but everything else They're is frozen, unresolved. Frozen totally conflicts, frozen. yeah. I, I, and we see more and more frozen conflicts now. They just I mean. they get stuck. There's yeah. sort of a point at which the violence burns itself out or, or halts, and then. But all the internal social conflicts, inter ethnic conflicts, or all the issues of sharing power and legitimacy, access to justice, all remain. Um, and that, you, you know. If people were perhaps paying a little more attention during Afghanistan, they would have realized that's what had precisely had happened after the mission had been accomplished in Afghanistan as well. And I fear the same may be true of Iraq. I mean, that's why we have to carry on reporting it. Are people getting thirsty yet? <laughs> One more. Um, I think this question sort of You've sort of touched upon it with your last answer, but uh, you said that you weren't sure that um, reporting helped to end conflict anymore. So I was just wondering what that means for you moving forward and what, how you're going to approach. Oh, uh, when I say I'm not sure, I mean I'm not sure. I mean, that doesn't mean I don't think that they... But do, do you have a different m um, mission with how you approach it now than <sighs> how you did 15 years ago? Uh, yeah, no. I, th I think you'll, I think I think it always changes. Uh, I think you know there was a period in which I was very interested in actually sort of observing, the, you know, the violence itself. And before that, I was interested in, s in looking at the aftermath of violence. And and now I guess I'm interested, uh, uh, as the gentleman at the back said, I, I, I become more and more interested in in kind of what happens when war wars finish. I mean, I, I'm more and more interested in that because because I'm not sure that we we have ways of describing it effectively, either in journalistic or political or any other language. And uh, I, I kind of think we should be the humanitarian interventions of the last 15 years have not been hugely successful. They have not been, you know, they've stopped the killing, but that doesn't mean they've solved the problems. And I think there is a great argument for rethinking the way that I if humanitarian interventions are going to be conducted, and I'm not sure on what terms they should be necessarily. Um, uh, or, you know, w w what should happen afterwards, and, and the afterwards question seems to me to be very, very important. The afterwards question seems to be very, very important. <laughs> It's a good, it's a, it's a cliffhanger. It's a cliffhanger, <laughs> yeah. It's a good I was thinking about writing the next book about that one. Uh, so <laughs> I'll leave you hanging on that one. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, you should probably be encouraged to buy a book if you haven't already. Um, but otherwise we should all go and get a drink probably. There'll be some burly people standing at the door. <laughs>